Good morning. Hello, everyone. I'm Angelina Carlton, the hostess of the Design Your Legacy podcast, where I look to distill the best practices, positive examples in action, and the best ideas to inspire you. As today's affluent are two-thirds self-made, I hope to invite a variety of guests from many walks of life and income levels to bring you their insights and experiences. These guests range from family office professionals, Hollywood directors, to those in Generation Z, as they each contribute their thought leadership to this subject of legacy. I hope to provide interesting guests who challenge your beliefs with their strong bias towards optimism in how you too can value your time, life, and personal legacy. This morning, I have the pleasure of introducing Katish Haberfield. She is an intuitive sound healer and a past life regression therapist. She helps people make sense of their life by understanding past, present, and future incarnations through shamanic sound healing journeys. Katisha's work helps her clients weave together the strands from all lifetimes so they can make peace with their journey and understand they are a perfect expression of their soul in this moment and incarnation. Welcome, Katish. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So I wanted to invite you on to this platform to talk with you a bit about, you know, I might call it succession planning and past lives, but I want to also add a bit about your background that you come from a family business in the sense of being third generation. So there are some roots in the business world and understanding that. Would you just touch upon that in a moment and then we'll jump into your specialty? Sure. So I come from a background of uh, family cheesemakers. So my grandparents started off as um, milk delivery people. So they, back in the day, used to collect the milk on their bicycles and horses and turn it into consumer products. So cheese, you know, milk, all the all custards, you name it, we did it. And uh, we had that business for 75 years in the family, but it's no longer around. So it wasn't part of my um, life until so it was heavily part of my life for the first 18 years of life okay. and until then I had never been sure whether I would do anything in that field but the business was sold it was a family decision uh, we had a family meeting uh, that it was too risky to continue with that business because of exposure um, we had a big situation in Australia where a small goods family had listeria problems. Okay. It was a salami, fam salami family okay. and my greater family thought 75 years of hard work, if we have something get into the milk or bacteria, it will wipe out everything that we have worked for. And so they decided to sell at the right time. And so I understand what it's like to think about decisions that affect more than you, that affect our whole entire family and to understand that you can create your own future irrespective of your family's traditions as well. So Yes, and one of the benefits of the work that you do has to um, do with understanding what, might el what else might be holding back somebody if they are struggling with limiting beliefs. Mm. So uh, where would you like to start the listener or their viewer in terms of past lives? Perhaps it's indicated in their astrological natal birth chart or your thoughts? Well, it all depends upon the particular person, where what's relevant for them. So a lot of people who come to me, come to me because they have this grand plan and a vision for their life, but it's okay. not working out. Okay. So they're not achieving their goals. And so what I look at is understanding the difference between what your conscious mind has set as a goal Okay. So you would be working with people with their conscious mind for their goals for the future to leave a legacy. Yeah. Yes. So my clients might say to me, I have these grand plans and something isn't working because it's not happening for me. And, you know, I have done all the mindset work. Okay. I have done all of the things with my conscious mind to lay plans and set goals and try to achieve things but something is derailing me and I am not consciously that I'm aware of derailing myself. Okay. And so that's where we then look at the subconscious mind 
and then the superconscious mind. So the subconscious mind is what runs the programs which direct us in life. And that's where your limiting beliefs generally are stored in this lifetime. So something happened to you earlier in this life. You know, somebody said something ha harsh to you. You had a negative experience, or a traumatic emotion or whatever. And that created a set of beliefs about yourself in the world. Okay. Which then when you try to achieve goals or be who you want to be in the world, you come up against a block. You will do something that creates uh, a problem in your life or you will start to believe something about yourself that will stop you from reaching those goals. Now, where that gets interesting is that you can clear those current subconscious blocks. So you can do all the, the work that you like in the world. You can with your subconscious mind. But actually, sometimes, and this is where I find it really interesting, the secret is not in your subconscious mind. It's in your superconscious mind. The superconscious mind is the part of you which has always existed. And that's where we get into past lives. Okay. So this is where we get into the idea, which is consciousness as a stream is not bound by physical time. You as a soul, there is a part of you that has always existed. You as Angelina and you as many other lifetimes before. And why that's relevant to legacy planning is some people have had things happen in other lifetimes which have caused them to say before they die, I will never allow this to happen again. That reminds me a little bit of that, uh, what, what is that movie? It was a Pixar movie. Uh, do you know the one I'm talking about? There was the guitar players and they didn't want the sun, Coco. Oh, yes, 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 yes. okay, yep. Yes. Yeah, so, and we, we uh, you'll see it, uh, it's not a conscious, so, sometimes it's conscious and sometimes it's unconscious. Just at the moment of dying, you, you actually go through a life review pretty much as you're crossing over to go to whatever you think is on the other side. And basically, your mind reviews all the things that you had hoped for in this lifetime. And does this part of the, the actual release process to allow you to let go of this human body okay. and move into the next dimension, the next realm, is for you to go, well, I did this, 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 I said this, didn't do that. Like you have to go through a physical review. And the only reason you will ever believe what I'm saying right now is if you watch somebody die. And I've had the privilege of watching somebody die. And yes. you can see, and if you talk to anybody who works in a hospice or a hospital, quite often before we die, we go into the space where we're not really here, we're unconscious or we're dreaming or sleeping a lot. And you'll watch that, you know, people in hospitals will say, oh, mum's not here right now. She's she's resolving things. And they, people will start talking to spirits and things like that. And it's, they're working out what's happened in their life and what they're, what they're happy with and what they're not happy with. And so in that space, a lot of people might say, well, you know, I was treated badly or this happened or I became broke or a man will never or a woman will never do this to me. And that's where we make what we call uh, unconscious vows. And that thread is in your mind. And that will sometimes, if it's strong enough, transfer into your next life and impact. Does that make sense? It does. And, and one of the reasons why also I think that this is valuable is because I think it speaks to areas that we need to consider learning about and having a growth mindset. So it's not just the, the business knowledge or the collegiate knowledge or the financial knowledge, but there's also this um, other area in what our eyes can see or, or not see in the other realms that could possibly exist. I mean, I don't know if science proved has proved it one way or the other. I, yeah. But, uh, but I think, you know, one of the things that you brought up the last time we spoke is, you know, we're very pressured around time. And what if we mm. had more of a bird's eye eagles view to consider uh, the things that we're meant to learn in this lifetime and, and also how our soul needs to grow in addition to those, let's call it family pressures. Absolutely, yes. Um, it is really a big mind shift. And for those who need scientific proof, then that's a whole journey that you can go on. There are plenty of organisations uh, that work with the scientific side of consciousness. And uh, you could start with, say, for example, uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. He does uh, a lot of work with the mind. 
uh, lots of Buddhist monks work with understanding the mind and what consciousness is. So you can go down there at that way and learn about that. Um, I always think it's helpful if you are the kind of person who is really driven and you've already studied your conscious mind, you've already worked with goal setting, you know, you're a fan of somebody like Tony Robbins or anybody who really works with changing emotional states, who likes to work with and understand the impact of your emotions on achieving things in life, then it's not that hard of a step to understand the subconscious mind. And, you know, any studies in psychology will tell you about the subconscious mind. And then it's a little blip, truly. It's only a little blip to the super conscious mind. So yeah, it is about, is it appropriate for you in this lifetime? Do you feel drawn to it? Is it important to your legacy for you to examine this concept of what is the mind? You know, it, it might not be relevant for you. Probably if it's not relevant for you, you've switched this video off already. But if it is relevant, you're here watching this conversation and you're suddenly intrigued. And my key thing in life is just to ask people to follow their curiosity. What conversations are suddenly interesting to you that can lead you to opening your mind and looking at your lifetime in a different way? Because your number one responsibility is to be true to yourself. Yeah, and I think people are waking up more and more today. I think people want answers and they're considering new sources to try and make sense of this reality and, and this life. Yes. Mm. So, yeah. so, so would you say that past lives are, are they in our astrological birth charts? Uh, they are, they are absolutely. And you can okay. speak to people and get past life uh, reports done. Okay. For me and for clients, for myself, the only, the main reason that they would want to know about their astrology is uh, if romance is really affecting their life. So romance in business world can affect if, you know, you get married seven times and your legacy financially is being split up each time. There's okay. a form of self-sabotage or sabotage somewhere there where you're allowing the things that you want to be achieving in the world to be affected by the emotions of love, uh, desire, anger, jealousy, greed, lust, you know, those things. Right. And if you can take a hard look at yourself and say, do you know what? My romantic world is stuffing up my my desires, the things that I want to do and causing problems in my business life. And it, it takes a, a hard look to really allow yourself to truly realize that that is impacting and moving over into that life. Then your ast astrological chart will actually help you understand what you need in this life for a romantic partner. And when you realize your soul's needs, then you can achieve things so that it doesn't impact it boosts your ability to achieve in the world because love makes the world go round. So we all perform better when we are in a pleasant state. Yeah, I think also what you're pointing to is if um, somebody is stuck, this can be a remedy to take their pain away so they don't feel like what I call they're in that loop around the airport regarding mm -hmm. frustration. Okay, very good. And I again, I appreciate the insights that you're bringing. So here's another question. Uh, what does deja vu have to do with past lives? Sure. So deja vu is often experienced when we go somewhere, especially okay. when we're traveling, and you think, this is really nice. Or if you have, if you meet somebody and you think, I know, do I know you? And they're like, no. And you're like, oh, your face is really familiar. And you're like, oh, don't worry about it. Usually it means that your mind, the continuous part of you, is recognizing someone somewhere from a previous life. It's like a blip in the continuum. Okay. Okay. So, yes, you do know that person. Yes. And in your view, are past lives real? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. Once you experience the fact that you are an eternal being and you have a realization about a past life, your world outlook changes because you realize that you are bigger than this body, this personality, and that your legacy is bigger than one lifetime. Okay. And if I were to say to you, time is not linear, what would you say back to me? Time is definitely not linear. Okay. However, that's the construct within which we operate. 
Okay. And so it's about opening your mind to understand we live in a world that is governed by the clock, but we need to learn how to control time, not the other way around. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So one of the things that you also specialize in is sound healing. And I know that you have some of the singing bowls, it looks like behind you. Mm. How can sound help us or heal us? Mm. So sound helps transmute emotions. And so what it does is if I play the singing bowls with an intention, okay. so say uh, you are experiencing frustration or anger or grief, okay. I can use the singing bowls to take you into a very relaxed state and we can actually go into the subconscious mind or the superconscious mind, depending upon the intention of this session, to actually find out the root cause of that emotion okay. and help bring it up and out and alleviate that emotion and actually through the intention of this session, help you move that into a new emotion. Okay. So it it's, it's works with the inner mind. It's very, very powerful. So it's almost like if there's like a, I don't know, a metaphor, I'm going to say like a clump, a clump of clay. It's like getting that unstuck, un, un, like less hard and clumpy, freeing it so that person can flow more with the energy within them and not feel so frozen, whether it's frozen in trauma from this life or maybe a past life or something that they're just, again, blind to because it could be in their subconscious if they've, especially yes. if they've repressed it. Yes, absolutely. Well, a lot of the physical ailments that we have in the world, like especially in the business world, say you have a stiff neck okay. um, or your shoulders are really sore, right? You're carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders, right? Yes, yeah? yes. Great. If you have digestion issues, you're not digesting life. Ooh, that's deep. Okay, okay. Yeah, and so we can work with that. We can clear the emotions that you are holding on to in that part of your body. So you hold on to emotions in different parts of your body. And when you can identify that um, you are holding on to emotions in a particular part of the body, you can focus your intention on that part of the body and you can release that emotion. So right now the world is feeling a lot of grief <laughs> and it's in the lungs. The lungs is grief. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I only laugh because, uh, yeah, it's a global feeling. I think of uh, a little bit of uncertainty right now, as much as people are, are waking up, I think simultaneously they're, uh, you know, probably wondering about the uncertainty that next month or next year could bring. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So what would you say is the link between sound healing and past life regression? Okay, so I'm pretty much one of the only people in the world that I know of that uses the crystal singing bowl to take you into your past life. Okay. So most people will go to a uh, past life regression therapist or a hypnotherapist, right? They'll okay. sit on a cou couch, they will just lie there and close their eyes okay. and they will then go through a traditional hypnotherapy practice where they will be put into a relaxed state of mind. Now, a lot of people get really anxious about that Okay. because they think, oh, I don't know if I can relax that much. Because what happens is our mind constantly talks to us. It thinks, oh, I don't know. Am I doing it right? Am I making this up? You know, they get really tense. Okay. It's the opposite of relaxation, right? Okay. So if I play the singing bowls, you are overcome by the beautiful sound of the bowls and it works with relaxing all of your body. And I find that people go into the correct alpha brainwave states faster and deeper. So they can't help themselves. Okay. They get so relaxed that they stop worrying about are they doing it right? And that yeah. allows me to. Yeah, I, I love what you're saying right there because the, the what I do know about the brain is most of the time people are in survival, which is like the backside of the brain, like the, mm -hmm. the lower stem. And if mm -hmm. we could just consider shifting more to like the front side, which is like, you know, the passions and the purpose and, and the legacy here, then we don't have to live back here, which is, I think one of the things you're pointing to is if somebody comes into a session with you and then they just maybe start telling you what they think you want to hear compared to actually getting answers that are true, that will free them up. Mm. Mm. 
Yep, you have to bypass. The the ego is there to protect you, and that's the fight flight is the ego, right? <laughs> its whole purpose in life is to protect you. And the problem is, like, it's like your best friend. It wants to be your best friend. Yeah. The problem is it's like a really overprotective helicopter mother. Yeah. <laughs> it's trying to bubble wrap you. Yeah. And you're like... I need to get out. I need to try. I need to be my own person. Yeah. And it will do everything in its power to keep you safe. And we all know that freedom comes from stepping out of your safety zone. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to make a, a joke uh, about kneecapping in the sense that if I ask a client about, you know, if they would like to, you know, skydive and jump out of an airplane, their neural net or their ego could say, oh my gosh, that's so scary. I don't want to do that. But you ask their spiritual self and they're, you know, they could be a kid at heart and say, let's go. And it's yeah. two very different perspectives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. You need both. You just need to let um, the ego sit in the passenger seat, not the driver's seat. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so how can past life regression allow us to gain insight? whether it's into other lives that then obviously ripple effect into this life. And I do know a few people that have done it and it's rewarded them immensely in terms of their mindset. Mm, so basically any, any starting point that you have, I want to investigate uh, an emotion of any description or something that is happening in your life. What we do is that we take you to the most relevant lifetime that is the root causative event of that emotion or thing that's happening in your lifetime. So a very good example is that in my own life, to give you an example of my own life, okay. um, self-sabotage has been an undercurrent theme, but not at a conscious mind level. So yeah. if you followed, if you wanted to follow my lifetime and understand how much time I've spent studying the mind and doing all the things, you would say, okay, she's missing some key goals and checkpoints that don't align up with what she's verbally saying mm. and what she's planning for herself. So if we go back and see what the root cause of that is, the root cause of that was actually self-punishment and self-punishment um, can be, a, is a, a major form of self-sabotage. So if you um, go to my podcast, which is The Infinite Life, the most recent podcast I do for listeners, an example of going into one of my past lives okay. where the specific point of the session, so I paid for another therapist to, to help me for the purposes of having a demonstration on my podcast. Okay. So my question for that episode was, what is my form of self-punishment that I seem to be doing in this lifetime that is holding me back from achieving specific things in my lifetime? Right. And so we accessed the life that answered that question. Wonderful. And I just wanted to say thank you for being so vulnerable. No, oh, you're right. That's that's what I have to do because it's an unknown area. My job is to take you to the other unknown and I have to pro provide some concrete proof or evidence yeah. to make you feel comfortable. Yeah. And, and there's also an expression in, in the coaching and advisory world that you have to do it yourself and, and have gone through that transformation before you can guide someone else through Absolutely. to have them also arrive there. And I also just love that you're pointing to that because it's just so honest. I mean, you're obviously not the only person that has ever struggled with that, thought that, and yet you have the courage to come forward and do the work, the inner work that's needed to free yourself to go to what I might call your next upper limit or your next uh, stage of development. And you also, you come from a corporate background. Mm. Yeah. I mean, this was something that you came into in, in I, I might say the last few years, but before then, I think you were, you know, what you studied in school, it was very business oriented, very structured, very left side of the brain. Absolutely. Yeah. I worked for my first job um, was with, uh, it's now called Accenture, the world's largest management consultancy, yes. you know, um, and then I was a university lecturer. Uh, I taught uh, the MBA level marketing, you know, for, um, students so I understand business principles and I've studied in my own time the mind I you know all, one of my questions to myself was always why don't I become a psychologist or somebody in that industry because I I'm fascinated with the mind but for me that what neither of those were my purpose 
and my purpose has revealed itself during COVID because we were granted the freedom to say, hang on, time is pausing. It's still going on, but effectively the world is changing for a while and we're being put in a holding pattern. Yeah. How can I give myself permission to just learn for a bit, follow my curiosity and say, what's here for me to know so that I can move forward after all this goes away and we go back to the new normal because now is a precious chance to say, What's not working? What do I want the future to be like? And what haven't I tested or tried yet? You know, it's a scientific approach. What haven't I tried before? What have tick, what have I learned? What have I had? What hasn't worked when it should have? Right now, let me try that for a while. I've got the luxury of this time. Yeah, and I think also one of the things is I think people are more open to it today. Because, you know, one of the things we've chatted about briefly is as somebody is waking up, they can come across, you know, feelings of not just grief, but like shock in the, like the, the stages. And, and I think more than ever, people are, are searching for answers and new ways of finding those answers. I mean, it, I, I, I know that technology these days, it's like, I don't know, an $11 trillion industry or something. But, and, and while technology is wonderful and it makes our conversation today possible, I think that we are more than just creatures of convenience. I think we're here to grow and to evolve. And again, who do we get to go to to have these types of conversations? And so with your willingness to come forward and to study this with the same intensity that you did regarding your prior careers and your prior um, you know, choices and, and life experiences, I mean, you were a hard worker in college. I mean, so everything you've done, you know, it's like you put 100% of yourself into it. So this would be no different in terms of the level of professionalism and expertise that you bring. I just wanted to, to bring that up. Thank you. And I also get a kick out of um, studying, it's the personality side of me, things that people don't want to talk about because I'm fascinated <laughs> by it. Do you know what I mean? It draws to me because I have this thing of, well, why shouldn't we talk about it? You know, yeah. if the world says it's not polite to talk about death and what happens when we die. Or money. Then Keep I, going. Or, yeah. or money. Yeah. yeah. Well, then why? Why? You know, so I need to find out why. And then each time I ask the question why, I uncover another layer. And I think for the world, what's happening is that, and it happens naturally in each generation. You look at your parents, right? You see what they went through to get where they are today. You see their assumptions and levels of um, what they had to do to provide for you. And the choices you they see, made and the reasoning yeah. behind it. Yes, yes. And, and a lot of us go, ah, uh -uh, that's not for me. Yeah. I appreciate what you did, but I want to do it smarter or faster or easier or more joyfully or more fun, right? And each generation is becoming more and more okay, I see the traditions, I see mm -hmm. what you've done, I value it, but it doesn't ring true for me. And I think the journey is about simply learning from others, watching and observing tradition, and then really sitting with yourself and saying, how does my body feel about this? Is this true for me? Or does it ring not true? Does it make me feel like there's something missing? And if there's something missing, that's the clue to look for the something that's missing. Yeah. So in other words, I think kind of, I'm just going to reframe it for a moment uh, for, for the, the listeners and viewers. So if a path worked for your parents, that does not necessarily mean that it's also going to be your path. So in other Absolutely. words, take the personal agency to embrace your own journey because it's okay if it's different than perhaps what your parents walked. Absolutely. Yeah. Wonderful. So speaking about past lives, what if I was a bad person in another life? We all have been a bad person in another life. It's like the, it's the thing we all fear, yeah? Okay. We all think <laughs> right now, I'm a good person. Yeah, what in this life. I, yeah. yeah, in this yeah. life, I'm a good person. So I should have always been a good person. But guess what? There is dark and there is light. Mm -hmm. To have a complete journey as a human being, we have to have had negative experiences and positive experiences because essentially what happens is the soul wants to grow 
And so the soul seeks out experiences. It's curious. It's curious. The universe <laughs> wants to know what it's like. It's like, what happens if I did this? What would happen if I did that? So if you're in a situation, let's have a look at money, right? Your soul will experience every element of money across all incarnations. So in one lifetime, you may be a beggar, right? No money. Learning the objective for that lifetime is to learn about disconnection from abundance, a belief in a poverty mindset uh, and every limiting belief you could have about money. You could then have a lifetime, your next lifetime could be complete contrast and you could be a multi-billionaire, yeah? Mm -hmm. And you experience that and then you might learn from that a few things. And it's like, do you remember like in the 1980s there were the choose your own adventure books where you, you got to a certain page and you're like, now pick, do you want to go option A or B? And then you went through and you watched the story and then you went, oh, no, 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 I like that one and you come back. Well, life is like that in that the soul chooses for you to have multiple different adventures on different themes so that it can have a balancing effect. And so you can be a nasty person with money in one lifetime okay. and a saint in the next lifetime. A following lifetime, you may be having a moderating influence. It's so that you learn. Is, is the worry, if I was a bad person in the last lifetime, I'm going to have to pay in karma in this lifetime? Is that a lot of the worry that could come up? It could come up, and that's a misunderstanding of karma. Okay. So when we die and we cross to the other side, the only person, and this might rattle a few viewers, but okay. the only person that judges you okay. on the other side is you. Oh, that'll make the sociopath so happy. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you set objectives for your lifetime okay. and what your range of experiences you want to have, what your key outcomes are. How you perform in a lifetime is up to free will and the choices you make in every day. But it's you're the only person who evaluates it. And you see like a movie of everything that's happened to you. You get to experience everything that you have done to others and done for yourself. Okay. So you make the judgments and the decisions after that life review on what you need to do and experience the next time round yeah. to learn better. So there's only ever you that judges you. So I think that's important in, in understanding that the only time that karma comes into play is that if you make a vow at your deathbed, which is, I will never, I will never let a man or a woman do this to me again. I will never let a child be hurt because I was abused in this lifetime. I will never go hungry again. I will never run out of money. I will never, whatever it may be. Then you take that karmic imprint into the next lifetime. Um, the other thing that can happen is if you say you murder somebody in a past lifetime, right? The karmic imprint is that in the next lifetime, you're going to have to experience what it feels like to be on the receiving end. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> okay. Good yeah, distinction so, to know. So, um, it's not what, you know, media and the world makes it out to be in terms Hollywood. of... Hollywood. Yeah. No. Yeah, okay. You know, yeah. Okay, very, very good. What is the, the... It's about, it's just about balance. Okay, sorry, it froze for a second. Say it one Ka more time, please. Karma means balance. Karma just means balance. Okay, great, great, yeah. One of the, the benefits that uh, we had talked about last time is... Um, and, I, and I'm going to say the word, but obviously it needs, this phrase needs to be broken down. Epigenetic transmutations for future reincarnations. And what I uh, got from that is if we're willing to do the work here and now, not only can that impact our life for the better here in this lifetime, but it could also have a positive ripple effect. Would you speak to that for a moment? Sure. So uh, as we all are learning more and more about it, when we're born, we're born to a family. And that, that family has a very unique set of circumstances and experiences. And through um, our DNA, we come into the world with certain beliefs and emotional experiences based on what your ancestors had experienced. So 
any improvement that you make in freeing emotions and changing belief systems that are holding you back, that then gets passed down in your DNA to your future generations and their future generations. So you'll notice that, say, for example, in families where they come from a lineage where there has been incredible grief or fear because of circumstances of war or something that's disrupted them. And so we get this subconscious understanding that it's unsafe to do something or we can't do something, but we don't know why. Okay. And it's encoded in our in our genetic expression. So they, there was just an, uh, an uh, internet article the other day here in Australia that made the front pages about uh, the, and I haven't read it, but it's about um, depression is now being shown to be epigenetically transmu transported down the genes. And so that opens up profound awareness that if you haven't dealt, depression is self-hatred turned inwards. Oh. If you don't have to deal with the self-hatred in this lifetime, you're teaching your children and anybody on earth who watches you that it's okay for them to hate themselves as well because you are displaying the leadership qualities of self-hatred. Yeah. So can I interrupt you for a moment? Yeah. So um, that's one of the reasons why I keep saying this phrase on this podcast, which is positive role models, positive role models over and over again, because if somebody has only seen, let's say what their parents have done and they don't seek out other influences or examples then they get trapped. And, and again, I realize humans like easy and simple and to conserve calories, but there's also so many other examples that are out there that they don't have to just fixate on, on one. So if, you know, mommy and daddy are narcissistic, for example, they can also consider how many other uh, examples, whether it's historical or living today. I mean, it just, it doesn't have to just be the professional athletes or the celebrities. I mean, um, you know, even you stepping into your shoes to do what you did took courage. And it's not for the faint of heart to say, hey, I'd like to step off the beaten path and learn about some things that, you know, might take some spiritual courage. And yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'll put a little tidbit into your mind. You chose your parents before you came to, to this lifetime, right? So if you chose narcissistic parents, there's a reason for that. You chose that quality as a teaching lesson. So you, it's in your power every time you make a decision about the influence that they have in your life and the influence of other narcissistic people that are in your life, you have the, you have the choice in every moment to break free and say, is that the influence I want? And then also, why am I attracting it? Yeah, so I might reframe it just for a second. So do I want to carry that pattern on? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, one of the, th the things that I um, think about, and I'm not sure if people are conscious of it or not, is if somebody does set that example, do I want to be not just influenced by it, but I use the verb infected, where mm -hmm. it's like, we don't even think. And it's like, we could almost be like hypnotized. It's like when um, somebody walks into a room and everyone's laughing and we find ourselves laughing, we don't even know why, or we walk into a room and everybody's angry and all of a sudden we're bitter. And again, we don't know why, unless we can um, be willing to be um, aware of what it is we take in and what, what we can also release and not, you know, carry forward, especially if it's somebody else's pattern. We're energetic beings. And so we are influenced by everybody else's energy every day. So it starts with stopping and observing the energy of the people around you. How do they make you feel? How do you act around them? What influence do they have on you? And do you choose to allow their energy to continue to pervade your space? Because we gravitate to and become like the people we are surrounded by. So yeah. it doesn't mean you have to cut them off. You have the power to allow how much, <coughs> how much time you give and how much influence you give. And so you can still love your family but you can be surrounded 90% of the time by people who inspire you or influence you more positively and you can provide them with a container within which to be part of your life. So take control of your energy. Really be aware of the energy that is around you and have the courage to say, I don't feel good around these people. Yeah. 
again, being at choice uh, through this education. And one of the, the valuable things I, I think you also bring is this being a tool that anybody can access. And I think people need tools. Sometimes when I see people arguing, I just think if they only have the tools, but I'm not going to obviously walk up to them in a grocery store and say that. No. <laughs> All right. So I've got a question about ar ar uh, aromatherapy. And then mm. I'd like to um, also just bring up one point and then I'll, I'll ask you about your legacy. Um, and the point that I, about uh, is about children um, before they're age seven. But what is the connection between uh, aromatherapy and sound healing? And also, would you like to define what that word is? Mm, sure. So um, aromatherapy is very interesting because we are sensory beings. Yeah, we smell, we see, we taste, we hear. And one of the things that I've discovered through my research that I, not many people are doing right now is so I use essential oils on the singing bowls. Right. And when you understand, and this is a whole nother discussion, but when you go in and study sound and sound waves and you understand light, and light waves when you activate and play a crystal singing bowl it sends out sound waves and light waves now that gets transported to you right you can hear my sound the sound waves are traveling with you you can layer the sound waves with aromas and every aroma comes from a plant right so uh so this is a bottle of essential oil here, clary sage. Clary sage, the intention of the clary sage plant, it's got a chemical constitution and that plant, when used in a liquid form, creates certain effects, right? And so it's it's documented, it's studied, you can read all the scientific papers if you want to. But when I use it on the singing bowl, I transport those qualities and that intention with the sound waves. Mm, and stacking intention. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Lovely. Um, are there any favorite scents? I always use clary sage in my yeah. sessions because it helps facilitate um, the clairs, so the especially clair vision, so being able to see, um, being able to uh, visualize and understand the experience that you're going through once your eyes are closed. Wonderful. So what is it about children before the age seven um, that they are able to connect or remember hmm. so basically if you look at any of the works of say somebody like Rudolf Steiner or um, other people that have studied there are scientists that are meticulously documenting scientifically now uh, studies of children and past lives and actually going that step further and finding the physical evidence of it so when we come into the body um, there it takes seven years for us to develop an eye awareness. You watch a baby, you know, they, for the first seven years of their life, they're adapting to the world around them and they're becoming who they are. But there's that point when a child gets to around seven, they're suddenly I, I want to, I am, they've got a real defined sense of self. Before that, they're very malleable and influential and still learning how to deal with the body and all of the functions that we need to be a human. The the veil between the worlds is thin for the first seven years. Now, we are designed as humans not to remember what's happened before we've come here, to make it easier to adjust to where we are. Some children, however, because it's part of their soul destiny, have chosen to be more aware of body right okay. so they will have experiences within the first seven years where they remember their past lives some of them can get very confused about who they are you're not my real mummy um all you have to do is watch go into twitter uh, go into uh tiktok at the moment and you'll see the funniest things that my kids have said to me and like there's one for example the other day where a mum's like my son just said to me oh geez mum i miss my wife <laughs> You know, kids say, the, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Kids, kids say the darndest things, but they're yeah. not lying to you. And the same with imaginary friends. Imaginary friends aren't imaginary. They can see things because they haven't be, got into our parameters of what it is to be a human and to function. And so those imaginary friends um, are actually uh, spirits, uh, ancestors, uh, past life friends that are there to help them 
um, navigate the difficulties of being a child and maybe they've come in with sensory issues disabilities or whatever yeah i just saw a video the other day um that i thought was fascinating about uh, indigo children and star children and rainbow children and i thought wow um you know who am i to discount this idea that perhaps people are born with certain psychic abilities and and personality types and um school teachers these days have no idea how to deal with that and yet they still bring their set of gifts that the world needs right now mm, yeah absolutely yeah absolutely it's it's about being open to understanding that childhood is a really precious time and yes kids say the darndest of things and they but there's still stuff that we can learn from them yeah it's a really valuable time when you know just because we have age superiority and intellectual knowledge superiority doesn't mean that we have insights that a child can't provide to us that make us stop and think about the way we're behaving and interacting and making assumptions and judging about the world a child sees things from the purest of versions yeah and they don't sugarcoat it sometimes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that they uh, probably can see things and sense things. And if we as adults can stay open to that, then how much more can that help our soul journey in this life? Because it's got to mm. be, you know, more than just the report card of a financial statement. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. So what values do you get to honor by doing this work? I actually wrote myself a little post tonight. <laughs> ah, good, good. <laughs> uh, look, my number one value is freedom. Okay. And it has been, I think, across all lifetimes. And it's not as I get older and I delve more into this work, my understanding of the word freedom changes. And particularly at this time in our history, freedom is the one thing that we've all had changed with COVID, right? So what I've learned for me that freedom is an internal state. Yeah, and I think Nelson Mandela's lessons of life, you know, also help us think about that. If you want to um, look back to when he was in the jail cell, he was like, I may be physically locked up in this room, but I have mental freedom to make this experience whatever it is. And in any day and in any situation, you may have certain physical constraints, responsibilities, expectations, legacies or whatever, but you have the freedom to change your life in every decision, starting from what you put in your Christmas mug in the morning for your coffee, you know, what you put in your mouth or what you drink, what you listen to, what you hear. Freedom, you have the freedom. And if you're constrained, then you need to check your assumptions because you find out where you're making assumptions about your freedom. My second value is authenticity. Um, you need to be authentic in life. Uh, I have a historically a problem with dealing with fake and shallow people. Got uh, authenticity is just, I like real conversations and I like to find the, the essence of the person. Courage is a very big value, value of mine. Courage, courage in every day, in any way, shape or form and resilience. I value curiosity. I value learning. Um, I value spiritual uh, investigation and understanding. And the one that I'm trying to work on in this lifetime is fun. <laughs> that's beautiful. Well, so I think that, yeah, go ahead, please. No, so I think that's, that's a lot of value. So, yeah, I just appreciate again that you are, um, that you wrote it down on a note card and that also that you're, um, you know, sharing it uh, publicly here, because then I think it also gives freedom for other people to say, well, if she can say it, you know, maybe I can say it too. And if she can live it and she's living her dream and her purpose, I can do that as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's important because uh, it, you have to be true to yourself and you have to choose the values that resonate with yourself rather than as imposed by anybody else in your life and values are not easy to find and they ch they change yeah 
they take a reflection. You have to really stop and be willing to look inside and get honest. And if you can't figure it out yourself, then be willing to ask three other people nearby. Hey, what do you think my values are? I'm stuck. You know, help me yeah. get some feedback. And then yeah. they could say some things and you're like, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you How do you say from? that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what would you like your legacy to be? My legacy, I think, is to help people understand and reduce the fear of death and the understanding that they are eternal. And so to take away that fear so that they can live fully in the moment and be themselves. Lovely. Very nice. Um, are, are there any websites you'd like to share or anything in terms of closing thoughts? Sure. If any of this has made you think, then uh, the best place to go into in-depth conversations is my podcast, The Infinite Life. And you can access that on all major podcast players, but also via my website, which is katish.com. And um, I'd like to deep dive into content like you do with your podcast. So my podcasts are about an hour in length. So uh, for people who are curious, they can go for a deep dive there or my YouTube channel. But my central point is katish.com, my website. Wonderful. And I'll make sure to include that in the show notes. Thank you. Um, I, I also just want to um, share my appreciation of how, talk about authenticity, how, how much genuineness you brought to today's conversation, because I know that this is a new subject um, in today's consciousness. And so I appreciate your bravery to bring it forward and the research that you've done ahead of time, whether it's the sessions you've had with clients, the sessions that you've had with others to work on yourself, to free yourself further um, as a guide to lead uh, people within this subject matter. Because again, you know, to find good talent in this world or to find good help, it, it's, um, you know, it's sometimes it's, it's hard. And who, who has actually done the work? You know, uh, there's that metaphor about, you know, the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. And so I just mm. appreciate that uh, you've done this you. spiritual work. So thank what you. a light, what a light. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So thank I'm you for read... your time today. Thank you. So I'm going to read the closing paragraph now. <laughs> All right. I, in closing, I'm Angelina Carlson, the hostess of the Design Your Legacy podcast, as well as the founder to Legacy Planning, a boutique coaching and advisory firm based out of Beverly Hills, California, but international in those I coach. I hope to dive deep into subjects that can help a person define, develop, and execute their legacy and continue to scour the landscape for those who can be great resources to every dimension of your legacy. For many listeners, there can never be enough education and preparation for what I call the moot around their castle. Whether you find yourself with new wealth or generational wealth, may the content of this channel be an anchor in any storms ahead. We do our best to provide original content for your intellectual and emotional curiosity. Thank you for joining us today. And remember, I coach people on the subject of personal legacies. Of course, please do your own due diligence as some areas are black and white while others are gray in nature in a changing landscape. And I hope that you find these interviews entertaining in their education. Thank you so much for joining.